What's up, y'all? Welcome to The Chess Giant. This is Solomon Rodell. I hope y'all are having a great day. And as many of you probably know at this point, I earned both the CM and the NM titles by playing nothing but the Hippopotamus Defense as white and black. Now, in today's video, our 75th Hippo video on this channel, I'm going to be recapping my top five games from memory and, uh, yeah, just kind of going over um, some, of my, some of my favorite moments with playing the hippopotamus defense. Now I'm not making this video to brag or make you guys think that I'm a perfect chess player. I'm sharing this to show the different styles that the hippo player needs to be prepared for, right? There's gonna be times where our opponent just goes crazy. They just go crazy and we gotta play some defensive chess, right? Now this, in my opinion, doesn't take up a large majority of games. In fact, it's a very small percentage in which case we gotta play defensive chess, but it does happen, all right? Then there's also games where we play aggressive, fun, attacking chess. And there's also games where our opponent overextends and we have to take advantage of positional weaknesses. All right. So let's take a look at number five. I got my uh, my guy here, James Garland. I was playing as black. I'm just going to be zooming into the middle game right as we go over these five games. You guys know what we're doing. We're double feeing, cutting our bishops. We're tucking our knights. We're getting six, you know, four to six pawns on the six, the rank, uh, much of the time, six pawns. And uh, we're going from there. All right. So here we got this position. Now, if I play a6, that actually gives me my full thick-skinned hippo, right? I got six pawns on the sixth rank, my bishops are being kettled, all the good stuff. The reason I didn't play a6 is because we got to ask ourselves, what's the whole point of playing a6? Well, there's a few reasons. First off, it's uh, it's meant to help prepare b5. But guess what? b5 is simply off the cards, guys. It's not going to happen because of this pawn on c4. So in that sense, a6 is kind of pointless because if we do prep b5, white just wins a pawn, right? Another reason we play a6 is to prepare, prepare for a4 and a5, in which case, again, we respond with b5. But again, there's a pawn on c4, right? And I don't want to get into a situation where I'm playing a6, and then after a4, I'm trying to stop a5, so I play a5, right? I want to use only one tempo if I need to, not two. Now, the third reason, and this is actually a reason why, you know, a situation where you may want to play a move like a6, even against, right, uh, you know, a pawn on c4, for example, the reason is if you're trying to play c5, right? If we're trying to play c5, we, you know, we gotta, we gotta watch out for a little knight jump in here to knight b5 or something. That's one of those instances where you can move that pawn. But in this case, I'm thinking, you know what? I'm not playing b5. I'm not worried about knight b5 here. My pawns are all very well protected, right? The base pawns of a7 and c7 are defended by my major pieces and everything else is defended as well. Um, pertaining to the pawn structure. So in this case, I play the move of f5. Now, I thought about this move for quite a bit and I was, you know, I was trying to figure out what to do. Um, the reason I went with F5 is it's not so much because, you know, uh, this pawn was weak, although that was a part of it. It was more the fact that if white captures, right, I can capture back and white has a bishop on this file. I'm not worried about this file opening up. Whereas if I play a move like C5 here, white could just take and I don't see how this helps us in all honesty, right? Just allowing their queen slash rook or both to activate on that default. When playing the hippo, we always have to keep in mind, how am I improving my pieces, right? That's the first thing. But on top of that, am I improving my opponents? Am I helping their activity or am I limiting it, right? We always got to look at that. So in this case, I play the move of F5. And here we have knight h4. Now this is a blunder. Why is that? Because black has f4. This is a fun little hippopotamus defense trick that you can use uh, whenever white, you know, forms a little battery and then starts going crazy on the sideline with their knight. Play f4. Guess what? If you don't move your bishop, I'm taking it. And the second that you do capture on f4, we have a fork, forking both your minor pieces. And uh, in the game, we have queen e2. And this is one of the situations. I know that as black, I'm about to be at material. I'm not about to get checkmated. I'm simply winning this position, but I have to play correctly right? There's going to be times in the hippo where your opponent goes crazy on the king side and you got to go, okay, you just gave up a piece. You just gave up two pieces, whatever it may be. I'm winning. I just have to hang on, but you do have to play, play with some level of accuracy, right? In this case, I ended up deciding to snatch off that bishop. We have a little check here. I move my king over. Notice by the way, knight g6, I already got that covered, right? We're good there. E5 is played. Uh, white here, you know, just trying to go crazy, trying to make something out of this position. And you got to, right? If you're down material, you got to try to attack. You got to try to make something happen. I mean, if you don't, you're just going to, you're just going to lose in the end game. So E5 is played. I ended up capturing. And then after D5, continuing to push, I ended up taking again. 
queen e8 offering a trade. I'm up three points of material. If I trade queens here, I'm going to have the better end game. So bishop g6 is played. I actually took with the knight. Um, and then after queen f5 check, just move my king over. Okay, by the way, if you guys want to see my, my full analysis on any of these games, I will leave all five videos down in the description below. Okay, this video, I'm just kind of recapping and going through things a little bit quicker than I usually would. But if you really want to get the in-depth analysis, uh, once this video is over, you can you can check out one of those guys. By the way, if you guys are enjoying this kind of content, enjoying hippo content, enjoying content that's you know made to help you improve at chess, and I, I'm hoping that it's doing that, make sure to subscribe. Right? I was I was recently checking, and I think 75% of viewers haven't subscribed. So uh, yeah, subscribe, and uh, yeah, I appreciate y'all. So we have this move knight g6. I save my rook. Okay, I mean why not? Uh, knight b5 is played. I drop my knight back to f8. What I'm doing here, I'm attacking this knight twice, and I'm also attacking this knight on b5. Okay. Knight takes f8 is played. I capture back with the bishop. Notice that c7 is now protected. And if you did take on c7 before, okay, I take your piece, right? And I'm going to end up getting two minor pieces for a pawn and a rook, which is very much in my favor. Um, I'm, I'm taking two pieces over a rook and a pawn any day of the week. So we got this move. Knight takes, bishop takes, defending that pawn. The knight drops back, and now it's just a matter of kind of re, you know, coiling my position up a little bit. Rook g7, defend the pawn, offer a trade. If white doesn't want to trade, they have to drop all the way back, which is what they did. Bishop e7. I'm now threatening this move of bishop c8, which which looks pretty dangerous. G4 is played. I snatched that guy off. I played g2. Bishop c8. Um, and here, you know, white looks to offer a trade, but I go, you know what? I'm gonna throw in a little check. Bishop f4. Um, you know, bishop f5, I'm up material, and I'm the one now with the activity. I mean, a battery ram going all the way down to b1, a bishop on c1 as well. And uh, yeah, queen g5 offering trade. Notice that knight can't take because it's pinned. And the second the queen drops back, I trade off. And uh, yeah, I mean, here white resigns. It's about minus nine for black. So things are looking pretty good. I mean, but you know, this, this pawn on h2 is under attack. Uh, G2 is very well defended, and uh, at the end of the day, I'm just up four points in, in material at the moment, and it's going to keep going up. So, all I'll say, I included this game because I think, you know, uh, it's it's a good representation of the fact that, you know, sometimes as a hippo player, when you're getting your setup going, or, or even right when you do, your opponent may attack you like crazy, but in most instances, they're just making a big old mistake, right? As one of my friends told me, if you're playing the hippo, you got to give it a hug. Don't hit it. Don't mess with it. Just give it a hug. Hang out with it. But if you go too hard against the hippo, you're going to pay for that. So all that to say, keep that in mind, knight h4. Uh, if you if you have this kind of position, you can actually trap that bishop and force that bishop to walk into a fork. I do want to mention as well, if white takes on g5, right? It may seem like, okay, I mean, they got three pawns for a piece. Bishop f6 is played, though. And the second this queen moves, right? Let's say queen e3 or something. Boom. We take, you know. They got three pawns. We got two pieces. I'll take it. Now, our next game, okay, our next game um, is against my guy Felix. And this is actually the morning, uh, you know, I was in my recent tournament, my last tournament uh, over the board. Um, I was 4-0, and this is the fifth game, okay? I'm, I know that if I win both of these games today, I will probably hit National Master. So I was feeling the nerves. I was I was hoping to, to win these guys. Um, but, you know, you just got to do what you got to do. Right. And as much as I wanted to hit 2200, I had to accept the fact too. like, OK, I'm just going to play the best chess I can. That's really all I can control. You can't control your rating. Um, I mean, I guess you can control your rating, but how are you going to control it? By controlling your moves and your level of play. So sometimes I think we worry too much about rating and not enough about improvement because improvement is going to bring rating. Right. Rating is just a byproduct of work, not the other way around. So here we have this move of a four, you know, white trying to slow me down. I play knight f6. Right, just just going for this pawn. First question you got to ask when you get into the hippo: which of the two pawns is the weakest? Right. I mean, here this pawn on d4, we got one, two, three, four defenders. This pawn only has one, so I go. You know what? I'm going to attack it. I'm gonna, I'm going to threaten this pawn. D5 is played. I lock things up immediately. Okay. Now in the hippo, oftentimes if you see e5, you don't have to play d5, but if you see d5, okay, if you see d5, you're oftentimes going to lock it up. And in a lot of ways, we're going to get an improved King's Indian defense here. That kind of idea, f5 on the way, g5, all that kind of good stuff. Um, h3 is played. I drop my bishop back because look, the way I think about it, you just spent all this time. You really put the work in. You pushed your pawns like crazy, um, you know, straight to d4, d5. This bishop's not active. Okay, let's just drop it back. No shame in that. Boom. It's part of the attack. Okay. 
Knight draws back. I play g5 because I'm trying to prevent white from playing f4. And if you play g3 now, I mean, thanks for the pawn. Thanks to my bishop on c8. So um, f3 is played. I play knight h5, knight g6. I'm just bringing my minor pieces over to the king side of the board. Bishop d7, you know, I end up going, you know what, let's just attack that pawn. Bishop b3, this is a great example of a great bishop and a terrible bishop. Okay, my bishop on d7 is doing an amazing job. It's on the opposite color of my dark squared pawns. This bishop, on the other hand, um, nearly all of white's pawns, seven of them, are on light squares. So this bishop is just babysitting a pawn. Mine's attacking it and doing more. And I just don't see much hope for this bishop. Now, my bishop is well right now. My dark squared bishop is a lot worse than their light squared bishop. But that said, as you'll see in this game, I was able to activate my dark squared bishop later. Okay. I played this move rook g8. This wasn't the computer move, but I don't really regret playing it. Um, just because you didn't play the computer move doesn't mean that you, you know, you didn't play a solid move. Sometimes it means you blundered, which I, uh, which I do sometimes, but you get the idea. Rook g8. I mean, I'm, I'm basically looking to open up this G file and I'm preparing, you know, this to break open. So white goes, you know what? I'm going to step out of the way and I throw my knight in bishop draws, drops back. I continue to advance on the king side. Um, here I capture back with the knight bishop h6, right? And, uh, okay. Usually I would take away from the center. In the hippo but notice in this case i don't have a bishop on g7 right and um, this could actually result with white potentially playing e5 and busting open the center i don't want that so in this case i take towards the center and um, i think this is the key moment of the game right because i think most players would want to be black here i mean we have an open g file right this bishop's active the queen's active the question now is is what do we do and i have to give my students this position and I ask them what they would do and sometimes I'll actually let them play as white and uh, as white I, as black I'll just go back and forth right I'll just move my king around blah 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 see what they do and it turns out white really doesn't have many prospects here in terms of uh, opening up this position let's just look at the pawns right we got eight on eight pawns can white find a break that's the first question well if you play a5 I could always lock things up right none of these pawns can move i mean okay i guess technically you can move these two but i mean if you move this guy what are you doing if you move this guy thanks for the pawn right away um yeah i mean this is just yeah you just don't want to move these guys this is not helpful to you with all this pressure that we have so you know if you push the pawn to c5 we have a double pawn clamp you know and you may be wondering too okay how does black break this position open the pawns and in this case i think all of our pawns have kind of done their job the question now is how do we improve our pieces right now a lot of players might just play queen h4 right away what i'm going to ask you is okay what pieces are not active right now i would say the queen's not as active as it could be neither is this bishop or the rook so in this case with this bishop i have all the time in the world if play this position as white right plug it in try to find some plans it's going to be hard white just doesn't have a great position so what i do here i realize okay i have time i'm going to go one two and three and then i'm going to throw my queen in right i'm going to bring my king up to e7 i could castle but then i'd actually fall into check and my king is actually a lot safer in the center right now um, because things are so locked up the hippo is backwards in so many ways most openings we got to castle fast in the hippopotamus defense there's a lot of games where i don't even castle or i don't castle until move 17 or 20 or 21 right now sometimes i castle fast sometimes i don't but the hippo is very different in that way on top of that as i mentioned earlier right usually in the hippo we take away from the center to activate our fianchetto not always but most of the time uh and then almost every opening we always take towards the center right so you know there's exceptions but yeah the hippo is just different it's just built different okay is what i'm trying to say so king e7 the reason i do this is to connect my rooks and double them up and this is exactly what i plan to do all the way back to knight h2 right bring that bishop in put the queen on h4 king up double those rooks and there's really not much white can do to stop it white's kind of stuck just going in circles so that's something you got to ask yourself how much time do you have in a chess game right hippo or not does your opponent have ways to improve their position or are they kind of in a position where they're just kind of moving back and forth and if they are moving back and forth that's that situation where you go okay i kind of have all the time in the world where do i want to place my pieces um without being in a rush of doing so okay now every move i had every move i played i tried to move with purpose but that said you know i'm not trying to win this game in, in two moves i'm just every move making a slight improvement slight improvement and eventually a tactical form in this case i take that that minor piece off i take on h3 
look, if you don't take my bishop can move literally anywhere right now, if it's black's move and it's going to be checkmate. So in this case, white takes, I snatch off the rook, the queen goes to f2. And uh, here I converted my attack into a plus three advantage. Um, I bring the rook in and, you know, have some fun here with the rooks, get busy. I'm pretty shortly here. Uh, white just resigns the game. There's just, there's just not much hope. I mean, plus five for black. This is, this is just over. Okay. So that covers the second game. Okay. Now the hippo, again, if you get that center locked up, oftentimes in a King Indian defense type fashion, it can be a ton of fun. Now my next game here, I included this not so much because I considered it to be like one of my best games on the board itself, but because this is the game in which case I'd be an inter international master with the hippo. I played against two IMs this last year, John Daniel Bryant, which you're about to see now, as well as I am Jack Peters. And I went one and a half out of two against international masters with the hippopotamus defense. So all y'all that keep saying the hippo is, is trash. I just don't believe you. Okay. I just don't about that. So, uh, yeah, I'm a big fan of it. As y'all can obviously tell, I made way too many videos, 75 of them now on this opening. So, in this case, okay, the I am, you know, drops back to h7. I play g4 going, you know what, if if I can make some space on the king side, why not? Um, I tuck my knight pretty quickly. I play f4, continuing to advance. Now here, after castling queen b6, black is putting a ton of pressure on me. So in this case, I go, you know what, I'll play g4, right? I'll cut that, I'll cut off the activity of that queen. We have, we have capturing on a four here. And this is kind of an interesting position, like very hyperdynamic in the sense that, okay, E5, I mean, this could be a great spot for one of my knights. E4 could be a great spot for one of their minor pieces, right? Based on the pawn structure. Right now I have some good space and a move like G5 could be fun at some point, but at the same time, I got to be careful about this F pawn because of my knight, right? So, you know, I think in this case, it gives about a minus 0.9 advantage to black. Again, one of the reasons why I don't think on the board, this is one of my best games. But I mean, 0 0.9, it's still a game, guys. All right now, once you get to two or three, it, it starts to, you know, oh, we're in trouble here. But, you know, if you're not even minus one yet, you're still in this game. Okay. Now, Rook FE8 is played. I continue with C4, looking to potentially fork. Um, and uh, okay, Queen C7 is played. I play Queen F3, trying to improve my position. Bishop E4. I go, you know what? Okay, we'll trade. That's fine. And I play Rook F2, right? g5 now i'm starting to go on the attack right things have kind of shifted here a little bit i'm starting to make a return in terms of the in terms of the evaluation uh, i give black upon there uh, but you know in this case where's the knight gonna go right i mean if you move the knight f7 is not looking too good so bishop c2 is played i end up just tripling up on the f file and um you know throwing my knight into f5 uh you know, and, and really here, black black needs to take that knight, which is exactly what they did. I end up taking back g6. I drop my queen back. We trade. Right now, guys, I'm minus one. But notice, right, this has been going on for quite a few moves now. This knight has been attacked, right? I mean, going all the way back to move 21. Notice how many moves that knight was attacked. Right, quite a lot, but black kept making threats, kept making threats against my rook, against my queen, all that kind of stuff. I kept having to respond, but now black has to respond. We see the move of rookie two. I go, okay, I'm not, look, I'm not taking your knight to lose my knight. I'm gonna run away with my knight, and guess what? Your knight's still threatened, and the second it moves, I take on f7. Knight e5 is played. I wipe out another pawn. Knight g3, I, uh, you know, I do a little rook lift there. Rook check, you know, knight goes back. I just start trading. Like, at this point, guys, we gotta trade down. And, uh, yeah, I mean, here, uh, you know, nice 3 knight 3 Guys, I'm not going to lie. I almost played king g2. That would have been absolutely just sad. You know, I mean, rook g1 would have been made. Thankfully, I saw it, at, you know, played king g3. Uh, but yeah, the rook comes over. And at, at a certain point here, we actually went into time trouble. I don't even have the whole game recorded, but I ended up taking on e4. Um, rook check. I mean, block. Why not, right? Block, trade down. King goes up. Um, and I just keep making progress here, surely but slowly. Rook d7. It looks like I'm offering a rook, and I kind of am, but then I just, I, you know, I have the ability to throw in that fork, which is nice. The rook runs away, throwing a check, and um, yeah, here I was up three pawns and ended up converting this into a win. Now, this game actually goes back a couple of years. In fact, the first day that I decided to play the Hippopotamus Defense, um, this is my third game in the tournament. Game one, I lose against a Fide Master. I actually got a pretty good position with the Hippo but ended up fumbling it away because I, I wasn't, you know, um, 
you know, at the time, right, I was still growing in my understanding of the hippo. I'm still trying to do that today. Round two, I beat a 2100 with it. Now I'm playing another 2100 with the hippo. And as you can see here, white did not play e4 and d4, which is usually what we see, right? We usually at least see a two pawn center, maybe sometimes a three or four. In this case, we only have one pawn on e4, but as you're going to see, white tries to pull off this move of f5. I play knight b6, tucking this knight right away and uh, playing c5 i'm like look if you're gonna give me space i'm gonna take it if you have your pawns here i'll play c5 if you had your pawns here oftentimes you can play f5 right depending on where your opponent's minor pieces are placed um, but in this case i'm thinking okay let's take up some space f4 is played i tuck my queen to c7 out of the way of that d file and after knight g3 I play d5 here i'm threatening to play the move of d4 white stops this by playing d4 themselves i ended up capturing off taking on d4 and here i castle queen side okay this is a game that i oftentimes go over with my students not because i think that this is a you know a kaspar you know kasparov karpovian game that's just off the charts no it's the moves i played here none of them were like crazy none of them were like oh my gosh i never would have found that they're simply moves that follow logical chess strategy, right? Every move here, I tried to improve my position, improve my pieces, and not allow my opponent's pieces to activate, right? So in this case, if I castle kingside, I mean, I'm sorry, but this is just not looking fun after f5, okay? I would say that white has one, two, three, four, five attacking pieces, and some of you guys might be going, why is this an attacking piece? It doesn't, so, it doesn't matter so much what the piece is doing now, but it more matters what the piece is aimed towards. And this bishop is aimed right towards my king. The queen is taking full control of those dark squares. The knight is ready to jump in. I got two rooks staring down my throat. This is just not good. Okay, so after queen takes, I ended up castling a queen side. Notice I didn't castle until move 17, another hippo theme. Uh, but okay, e5 is played, and this is simply a big mistake. This is the key moment of the game. If you analyze this position closely, you're gonna find that white really doesn't have much play and it's all in black's hand here in terms of how they want to improve their pieces. I've made some videos on this game. And again, I'll leave those, those links to these videos in the description below. But e5 is played. In this case, I go, you know what? I want to play knight f5, but I don't want to trade off knights. So I want to kick this knight out first and then bring my knight to this nice little outpost. So I play h5 and h4, kicking that knight back. Here I actually played knight c4 first. And then uh, h3, continuing to make an impact here. The reason I push my pawn all the way up here is because by forcing white to take or push, notice whenever this pawn pushes or captures this knight, this bishop is going to be a monster, looking all the way down to h1. So here I play knight f5. I'm threatening to fork both those rooks. Um, you know, white captures, I take away from the center. Very common theme in the hippo when you're playing b5, tucking that knight, right? And you get this kind of pawn structure and you throw your knight in there. If the knight gets captured, we're oftentimes going to take away from the center so that this bishop activates, right? I play queen c6, threatening a maiden one. Knight g3 is played. Hey guys, here I didn't take the knight on g3 because it turns out, okay, sure, h takes. I mean, we're just winning that game, but queen takes and queen h1. This is actually not winning for black. I mean, it's only about minus 0 0.3, mi minus 0 0.4. White runs away with the king. The question now is where does my queen go? Do I want to trade into an end game or do I want to really run all the way back to c6? This is not what I wanted. So after, after knight g3, I played knight e3. Notice this queen is overworked. It has too big of a job. It can't do everything. It can't defend g2 and take on e3. The second you do take, I just have queen g2 checkmate. So here I'm threatening the rooks and this pawn. White tries to solve this by taking, but I just capture back, win a pawn, and in this case, slide one step to the right. Queen c5 works as well. Both of these are simply winning. Um, as y'all can see here, I own both diagonals. A white cannot um, block with their queen because the knight covers those two squares. And um, one move later after bishop g2, white resigns. White resigns this game because white would have to give up their queen on g2. Okay, so in terms of instructive games, I would say that this might be the top one. Now, the final game, this is the game in which case um, I, uh, I became a national master. This is the game that pushed me over the top. I was 5-0 and Okay, earlier in this video. I think the second game we covered, I, I, I went over my game with Felix. Um, in which case I, um, you know, I won that morning game. So I went from four and to five and in this case, uh, my opponent here actually offered me a draw pretty quickly, but I, you know, I was thinking, you know, I'm going to clear first. And if I take the draw, I'll, I'll win first, but, um, I'm not, I'm not really here for the money. I'm more here to try to hit master. Right. So that was my goal. So I'm, I decided to push for a win here. Um, again, black here, not taking full control of the center. Okay. Kind of trying to advance on the, on the queen side a little bit here. 
I decided to take some space. I mean, if you're going to give me space, I'll take it. And uh, after night before, I kick that knight. The knight tries to reroute and attack my pawn, but I play knight f1, um, just defending that guy. And uh, yeah, I mean, the very next turn, I'm able to kick that knight right back. Knight e3, I feel very good about where my knights are placed right now. Um, you know, really covering a lot of a lot of key squares here, doing a great job. Uh, castling kingside is played. I ended up castling, and after a5, I push on the g file. Now, in general, I I personally, I don't know about you guys. You guys can let me know down in the comment section below. But if there's some kind of race, I would much rather be attacking their king than attacking air. So I felt pretty good in this position. I'm the one advancing towards their king. They're advancing towards air, towards space, right? Which is, I mean, it's not always bad to just gain some space but if we have a race i'd much rather be attacking the king than attacking nothing so um at least you know nothing in the terms of getting some kind of checkmate winning threat so in this case i uh, i play the move uh or i see the move of a4 uh, i just simply ignore it just continue to you know advance over here sometimes the more energy you spend on one side of the board the more kind of uh you know ground that they start to get right they start to take ground they start to take initiative right they start to um, be able to pour more energy into that spot because i'm pouring so much now i'm not i'm not just saying anytime anyone is attacks you you just need to not respond right i mean a huge part of defensive chess is knowing when to respond but also when not to right and in this case if i take this pawn i'm just i'm just kind of helping black black's just going to keep improving their pieces keep making space i'm going you know what i'll move and if you want to take my pawn then okay i'll capture back right and everything's fine so here the knight drops back um and uh yeah i thought a little bit in this position i ended up playing the move of knight e f5 okay my idea here is that i am attacking this pawn on e7 okay now if you play a move like e6 saving the pawn well you still get forked i'm winning your queen okay if you play a move like rook e8 i snatch off your bishop then play g5 and you are losing your knight so you really can't stop those two ideas but what you can do is at least take the knight first so black takes the knight now i'm down a piece for a pawn but you're either going to get forked or you're going to run into this position where i trade but then i end up you know attacking your pin piece so we're about to you know even out the material but black's king is obviously in a lot more danger than mine is now quick shout out to my brother joey um probably my favorite christmas present this year um you know one of my favorites uh just it was kind of interesting right so he sent me this chessboard and um i uh i was like oh that's interesting it's a chessboard then i found out oh the pieces are kind of stuck turns out same position as the game that i um that i hit master with so that was a pretty cool gift shout out to you joy um i'm probably gonna hang this up or put it in the background of my next uh, youtube you know setup background but just want to show you guys that thought it was pretty cool so um yeah, it was, it was nice of him to do that. But yeah, he, he basically, you know, put put a board together, um, drilled in the pieces and set up this position, right? So in this case, I'm going to win that piece back. Black plays e5. I, I snatch off on e5, take on f6. Now here I almost played queen f3, but we got to ask ourselves, how can we improve our pieces? How can we bring our pieces to the next level? If I play queen f3, okay, we're going to have a double battery ram why not play rook f5 first notice there's no pawns that can kick this rook out there's simply none okay now if you play a move like bishop d7 i'm just gonna snatch off that pawn i mean white's simply crushing there okay so why not improve this rook first then bring the queen to f3 and form a triple battery ram against this knight black plays the move rookie six i end up playing queen g3 with check and um yeah that was it right queen g3 check here um, white resigns the game, uh, or sorry, black resigns the game at this moment, because I mean, look, if you move, I just take off that pawn with the Bishop. Um, this is around plus six for white. Uh, I can't even, I mean, what do I even say? There's just so much going on here. So much is under fire. And, um, yeah, I mean, if a move like Rook takes, we could even take on F six, attack the queen, you know, keep trading down, um, you know, take the rook. By the way, in that in that position, you could take on f7. Absolutely nothing wrong with that. But also, I mean, if you take this rook, guess what? The queen's still pinned. Okay, sometimes it's good to ask, okay, wait, if there's a piece is if if a piece is pinned, can they get out of it? Right. And in this case, there's no way for black to get out. So there's in a weird way, there's really no rush for me to take that queen. Um and okay, we're gonna get the queen anyways. Tons of threats here on the board. Um 
you know, I mean, for example, we're threatening the rook and we're threatening to fork the bishop. If the rook defends the bishop like this, okay, queen f5, guess what? We just forked the rook, right? If the, if the rook comes to b6, um, guess what? We just forked the rook. So basically, you know, once we see queen g3, the game is over there. But, uh, but yeah, I think the key moment of this game was knight e f5, right? Realizing that black kind of ignore they, they they spent so much time pushing on this side of the board that they ignored their king safety specifically this pawn on e7 that gave me time to play knight f5 um, black had to defend that guy and then once once i saw that i, I ended up taking playing g5 um and uh yeah soon trading off throwing my rook into the best square it could find tripling up on that file and uh yeah black resides pretty soon after so let me know uh, out of these games which one uh, you uh, kind of reside the most with right and, and when you're playing the hippo right are most of your games crazy attacking chess we saw that we've seen you know the first game in which case i kind of had to go you know what okay you're gonna give me material cool now i gotta hunker down defend trade and go into a one end game um we also see games where right like against uh you know joshua allen harrison right the second game uh, you know, the second game, second to the last game, white pushes like crazy. How can we kind of find cracks in the wall and improve our positional chess, right? How can we improve our pieces without letting our opponent improve theirs? So let me know what, which of these games you like the most, um, as well as if you, if you have any questions about these games. And again, if you want to look at them in more detail, I have all of the links down in the description below. So you can go check any one of them out individually if you'd like to. Also, let me know what your experience with the hippo is. And uh, let me know if you have a favorite game that you've played with the hippo. And if you do, make sure to comment it down below or email me at thechessgiant at gmail.com. appreciate y'all. Thanks for watching today's video. I wanted to give a big shout out to my Patreon supporters for the month of January in 2023. If you haven't thought about becoming a member yet, I highly encourage you to think about it. You get some exclusive benefits by becoming a member and joining the family. And uh, yeah, it's been quite a bit of fun. We're growing a base here and I hope to see you there.